let's uh, go ahead and uh, get started here. Um, so today we're going to discuss EPA regulations as they relate to uh, underground storage tank overfill protections. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to meet those mandates and uh, some best practices. And um, before we get started, let me introduce our speaker and uh, we'll get right into our content here. So today's presenter is uh, Lee Girard. And so Lee Girard is our lifecycle management product manager for the ATG platform here at VitaRoot. Uh, Lee's got some extensive experience. He's got over 25 years of industry experience uh, related to ATGs, vapor recovery devices, fuel flow, uh, submersible pumps, as well as hanging hardware. Um, he's got a great background at um, not only, um, uh, you know, sales uh, experience, marketing experience, but he also has a technical field background as well. So um, without any further delay, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Lee and uh, we'll get started. Okay, great, Sean. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Hopefully this is uh, something that um, will benefit all and, uh, is, if anything, a, a good reference point for uh, making sure that you know, if you're an end user or distributor or just plain as a contractor out there, you know, you're dealing with the, the, the regulations uh, correctly. So. So there's, there's five things we're basically going to try to cover today in the next uh, 30 minutes. So we're going to talk a little about the regulations and the timeline for overfill and secondary containment, make a real quick snapshot of that. Talk about the new overfill protection regulation methods. Uh, then we'll want to talk about the secondary containment regulations because that's always uh, good to know and more importantly is something that is getting closer and closer from a, 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 a uh, standpoint from a date uh, requirement. And then we'll, we'll review those uh, UST release detection requirements that are out there and that are part of the new regs. And then the last thing I want to cover, just to make sure everybody uh, has a good understanding, is the new equipment maintenance regulations because, you know, ultimately all this equipment that you're working on or uh, managing or having to, to manage at your location, you got you to meet a maintenance requirement. So let's talk about the timeline first on the uh, on the EPA side of it. So this is just kind of a visual for for everybody. Um, in July of 2015, you know, the EPA published uh, their new underground storage tank regulations. Now moving a little bit further into the fall of last year, you know the, this is really about the overfill side of it. Flow restrictors in the vent lines may no longer be used. So some of you who have been in the industry for a while understand that. You know, the ball float valve system is really the flow restrictors that are out there. And they, they really removed them from the regulations because they didn't feel that they uh, provided the uh, adequate protection in an overfill condition. Now, moving forward to this year in April of uh, 2016, you know, owners and operators must begin meeting these requirements. And what, some of the requirements are secondary containment and interstitial monitoring uh, for new and replaced tanks and piping. So if you replace the tank or replace piping, they're requiring for you to use interstitial monitoring for those uh, types of uh, um, piping and tank systems. And then the other aspect of it is they're going to be looking for under dispenser containment for new dispenser systems. So that means they're going to want you to make sure that you have some type of containment system under the dispensers and ultimately they're going to want you to monitor that. Now, going forward a couple of years down the road here, um, owners and operators are, are going to have to start conducting basically their first test and start doing inspections. So they're going to have to inspect things like the spill prevention equipment, the overfill prevention equipment, and they're also going to have to test containment sump uh, and testing of those sumps and any piping related to that also from an interstitial perspective. And then also the release detection equipment is going to have to be tested, and we'll talk about that at the end. That's the last slide I have. And then the basic walkthrough inspections. So let's talk about the overfill protection uh, and the changes the EPA regulations have uh, come forth. So back in 1998, you know, all underground storage tanks that had deliveries of 25 gallons must have or more must have an overfill protection device installed. 
And, and if you've been around for a while, there's, there's multiple types of devices out there. You have an automatic shutoff device, which is a, a flapper valve, which is probably installed in, you know, 60, 70 percent of those tanks out there. Um, an overfill alarm. So if you have, a, a, like, a meter ATG system, you can connect an external device that will, will produce an alarm condition when you meet a certain threshold that's programmed in the console. And then the last one is the ball float valve that I talked about a little earlier. So again, as of October 13th, um, these vent pipe ball float valves are no longer be acceptable. And, you know, the real reason is because, you know, they don't feel that they, they provide the right protection. And then there's, there's requirements for the ball valve to work properly, and they found that those ball valves actually fail uh, more often than not. So here's a little bit about the, the ball valve and the ball float valve that's not accepted. So the ball float valve, you know, basically would alert the delivery driver, not the, not the station operator, of an overfill condition is reached. And basically what happens is it, it restricts the, the vent line that goes back to, through the line to the tank, which now technically creates a pressure change in the, in the vent line on the truck that's delivering product and then ultimately the, alerts the driver because of that uh, change in pressure. And that's supposed to indicate to the driver, hey, it's time to stop delivering. The problem with that is if the driver's not paying attention, he's not, you know, he, he's on the other side of the truck doing something, he could possibly not see that condition occur as it's occurring and potentially overfill the tank. Now, the ball flow valves cause wear and tear on the UST system because it's causing, you know, a change in pressurization in the tanks and in the lines. So ultimately, you could also cause issues with your tank and lines because of this uh, product. Now, some basic principles behind overfill conditions. And those of you who have been out there for a while in the industry probably seen these, experienced them. If you haven't, um, this is what's in the ground typically. So if you have a, an automatic tank gauge system like the V root system, we have a probe in the tank. That probe can read inventory levels. That probe can also be programmed through the tank gauge to sound an audible alert at 90% when it's in a fill or delivery condition. And then over to the right, this, this indicator here, this overfill alarm, and you may have one at your site today, buzzes at the, at the driver and flashes a light and, and tells them, hey, you're overfilling the tank. The driver can use an acknowledgment device that we have to this box to acknowledge the alarm condition after he's shut down the valve to ensure he doesn't overfill the tank. So that's the, that's the, the, the ATG side of it when it comes to overfill protection. The second one that you can use is the flapper valve. Now this is designed to restrict flow uh, a product around 95 percent in the tank. The driver's alerted when the delivery hose starts jumping from a hydraulic shock. That's really what happens. And the ball valve inside this flapper, when the back flapper valve goes up, restricts flow and then it restricts the product coming back into the tank. So these do work. The overfill alarm on the ATG is a great tool to have. The flapper valve is, is, uh, is, is a great tool also. But we, we feel that, you know, these solutions together um, help each other because if the flapper valve fails for some reason you sit and, you have an in, and you have a probe in the tank, and you got an ATG monitoring that tank, you now have a secondary device to ensure that you don't overfill the tank. Now, obviously, you can use one method based on the regulation, but again, if you have an ATG already installed at your site, um, you have that capability, like the beta root, to be able to produce this external uh, alarm and uh, light indicator. Now, one of the things you, you might want to Check locally if you, you, you have to deal with local regulations, is make sure that at the state and, and the local level, they, they, they require certain protection. So we're finding that some regulatory bodies require redundant protection methods, such as what I just talked about, the flapper valve and the ATG. So just verify that with your local agency. So why implement two protection methods? You know, slapper valve is really the not sufficient for standalone protection. Most people who don't use the Vita root or an ATG for overfill protection feel the flapper valve they're using, utilizing it is sufficient. However, 
you know, installation errors can cause the, the system not to work properly. Um, the flapper valve can be easily defeated. So people can, like this particular uh, example, somebody actually screwed down the shut valve and it would never, flap, never open up. So they were probably packing their tank as much as possible because it was an opportunity for them to be able to fill the tank up to 95, 100%. Now when the flapper valve does fail, there's no alerting of that failure. Um, nobody knows about it. So, and that's one of the risks you take of using just the flapper valve by itself. And then, you know, many flapper valves require removal to test. So again, you have to get somebody out there, they gotta perform an annual test, and then they gotta make sure that the system works properly. Now, some of the advantages of using an overfill alarm that's connected to an ATG, um, it's a single overfill alarm unit. Uh, it has advantages to alert uh, the, the driver dropping product, the operator at the store, and if you're utilizing uh, remote co connectivity types of devices uh, that you can use in most ATGs like the Visa Route 450 Plus, it can email somebody, it can, it can send them a notification to let them know that the tank's being overfilled, which is really important if you're the operator, owner, of that station and you want to know what's going on obviously at your, at your site. Um, it doesn't, uh, it's not susceptible to mechanical failures. It's really tough to, to, to beat it. Um, somebody would have to pretty much disable it uh, to, to, to get it not to work. So somebody would have to physically remove the ball or remove the buzzer to, to stop its functioning. Most of these are installed uh, 10, 15 feet in the air and uh, it'd be very difficult for them to do that. And what's nice about the, the overfill protection devices that are out there, such as the V-Root overfill alarm, is that you, ha you can go in and do a periodic test on it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, you could slide the inventory probe in the tank to create the alarm and, and sound the buzzer, and we also have a, a, a test button on the side of the device to make sure the device is still powered up and working properly. So a little bit about the overfill inspection requirements. So what's coming is every 30 days, they're requiring you to do some type of visual inspection to ensure the devices that you're using are not damaged or defective. Uh, these route, basically, we recommend that you use that test button I talked about a second ago on the overfill switch to make sure that there's power to it, the light works, and the buzzer works. If that's the case, and it's connected to the V route, it will work uh, when there's no overfill condition. Now moving forward, Every three years, you get to test the equipment and activate it to make sure it works at the 90% level. So for the beta root system, you got to move the move the probe float so it simulates the delivery and it goes exceeds the 90% level that's programmed in the console and make sure it generates that alarm externally and internally. And then if you have the shutoff devices, you have to make sure that it, it activates it and it prevents product from reaching that height of 95%. Now on the owner-operator side of it, you know, what's the best practice for the owner-operator here? So ensure that there's enough room in the tank before each delivery. And you know, you folks that are out there who've been doing this for a long time, who operate the sites, you know, you're, you're looking at the v root ATG all the time for inventory, water in the tanks, and your all of your available space. So Make sure you, you interpret that, and, and then if you're using uh, that to call delivery drivers, make sure you're, you're accurate with that information, because that's really the key. Uh, monitor all your fuel deliveries from beginning to end. Um, there's a lot of situations where even the drivers don't pay attention while they're delivering product, and they end up overfilling the tank and causing an environmental issue. Inspect those spill buckets you know, before and after deliveries if you can because that's important to know, you know, how well the delivery went and also if the driver um, took care of the, of the spill in that spill bucket. Because some of the new spill buckets have a plunger that allows that product to go back in the tank and simply just pulling on it allows the product to go into the tank. The ones that don't, as you can see in the lower picture here, you got to pump it out and, and report that. Now let's switch gears a little bit. We'll talk about secondary containment regulations. So for tanks and piping installed after April of this year, um, 
they must have secondary uh, type of containment with interstitial monitoring. So that basically means you have to have some type of interstitial sensor device like we have with the Vita Root systems where you can make sure that if there's a liquid condition in those containment areas or interstitial spaces, the Vita Root's going to alarm at you and let you know you have a condition that you need to address. Now, the secondary containment definition here says, basically, release prevention system has an inner and outer barrier with an interstitial space that is monitored for leaks. Includes containment sums when used by interstitial monitoring for piping. So, just keep that in mind. If you have secondary and, and double wall protection today and you're not monitoring them with sensors, you're going you're to have to move forward at some point to go ahead and get some sensors installed too because, one, regulatory bodies like that they know that you're being proactive, making sure you're monitoring those, those secondary areas uh, to prevent potentially environmental issues. And then typical in an installation, you know, the tank with the double wall construction with an interstitial monitoring sensor. So we have different types of sensors we have at Theta Root and, and other ATGs to be able to monitor that. We have some that discriminate between water and fuel, some that just tell you there's liquid. Double wall piping. Same thing, we have a, there's multiple sensors out there that can detect liquid or detect the difference between water and fuel and shut down the site if it need to. And then on the containment sumps, uh, again, it's just a combination of different types of sensors you can use for those applications. A little bit more about the secondary containment regulations on the testing side of it. So again, beginning on October of 2008, Owners and operators must meet one of the following for spill containment equipment for containment sums using a pipe being interstitial monitoring device. So ultimately, because um, I'm not going to read through this, basically the spill prevention and the containment sump equipment has to have double wall uh, and integrity of both walls has to be monitored. And then typically every 30 days you need to, uh, if you're not going to monitor those, um, from a manual perspective, uh, if the facility receives and frequent deliveries, then you, the, you're not going to have to um, monitor it in that fashion, but however, the operators have to discontinue this periodic monitoring and they have to go to 30 days to conduct the test, which I'm going to describe in the next slide. So on this particular uh, aspect of it, the spill prevention equipment containment sumps used with interstitial monitoring have to be tested at least every three years. So the bottom line is that if you're using interstitial monitoring for containment and spill prevention, then you have to test it every three years. There's multiple methods to test this. I'm not going to go through that. You can use it as a reference as, as a down the road. But basically, the, you, can, you can test the sumps uh, through liquid and pressurizing it. And then through vacuum, there's many methods that they use today. And then the last thing, again, spill prevention equipment and containment sumps using interstitial monitoring are going to, again, have to be starting to be tested uh, for tightness uh, after October 2015. Now let's review the underground storage tank release detection requirements. This is something that most of you know about if you've been uh, around for a while. So these are the different types of methods you can use uh, for your underground storage tank system. So, you know, basically monitoring methods that you can use, and you have to basically prove this every 30 days. You can use a tank gauge system. You can use vapor that monitors vapor in the soil. Um, you can use groundwater monitoring that monitors the liquid for hydrocarbons. You could use interstitial monitoring, SIR or statistical inventory reconciliation. You can use weekly manual tank gauging, and you could also use annual tank tightness testing with daily inventory control. When you do that number seven, then you have to do, you get to bring somebody in once a year to do that test. Going back to the interstitial monitoring, again, for those tanks that are installed after April of 2016, they're all going to be required to have interstitial monitoring for them. And this is, the, this is the last slide I want to talk about. This is the maintenance side of it. Um, it's really important because one thing that we found we find at Vita Root is that a lot of folks, if that, they're not required to do an annual certification, they won't do it to make sure their equipment's working. 
It's like not taking your car in for an oil change because you just don't feel like doing it. So this is really important because of all the regulations, all the requirements that you're, that you're being asked to do, it's to your best interest to get somebody who's a certified trained technician to come out and perform those annual certifications for those tests. So one, you have the records to prove it to any regulatory body, and two, just to make sure you have the protection at the site uh, with the ATG, because that's the investment you made. So again, with the automatic tank gauge, you gotta test for alarms, you gotta verify the system is programmed, and it has a battery backup, you gotta make sure it works. On the probes and the sensors at the site, that, you know, we want you to inspect for you know, any buildup on them, make sure the floats move, you know, make sure there's no damage on the probes or the shafts, Make sure cables are, are free of uh, debris, kinks, and breaks. And then you know, test the alarm operability of the system, too. Make sure it works. And then if you're using electronic leak detection, which you can with the V-Root system, you, know, you should have the, the technician perform a simulated leak for the three gallons per hour at 10 gallons per square inch. That, that gives you a good feeling knowing that your system is operational and it will detect a leak uh, if there's potentially a leak issue. And then if you're using vacuum pumps and pressure gauges, ensure there's proper communications with those devices. Now there are, for like uh, vapor monitoring and groundwater monitoring, there are handheld devices. However, you gotta make sure those handheld devices are working properly and they can sample properly. So inspect them. If they need to be calibrated, make sure they're, cal they're calibrated. And again, you know, owners and operators must maintain records for, uh, of release detection testing for at least three years. So ultimately, you have to keep those records and then prove that to some regulatory agency at some point down the road. Really quick, uh, just to highlight uh, Beetroot, Red Jacket, uh, and Catlow equipment. You know, we have a lot of equipment in, in the field. We can monitor the tank for inventory, tank testing, uh, automatic reconciliation, and we can reconcile your product. Um, submersible pumps to get the product to the dispensers uh, on the good, and then we also have mag probes to do the inventory and tank testing and then we have multiple sensors to be able to monitor all these containment areas that we were talking about um, and, and then again we have the overfill protection device that uh, you can install at, at the tank area that utilizes the in-tank in probe to, to generate that alarm and then we use this with our customers using our in, in the cloud service, Insight 360, to be able to give you all that data at your fingertips so you have that visibility to be able to know that your site's in an overfill condition and how it's going to be addressed. So at that point, Sean, you know, that, that's what I had today, and hopefully I was able to, to, to provide some insight to the folks on the phone. Great. Thanks, Lee. Um, Good presentation. Uh, I want to now open it up to, um, to Q&A. I uh, also want to point out um, here on the slide, we've got uh, contact information. You know, if you have a technical issue, you need to get in touch with somebody at Peter Root. Um, that's the best method there. My contact information is also there. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and get started with uh, questions. Got one here, came in from the chat window. Uh, can my overfill alarm be used for other alarm conditions to alert a driver? Um, the answer is yes. The, the, uh, the, any ATG that's connected to an overfill device, you can, especially the Vita Roots, you can, you can program them for any alarm condition. So for instance, the overfill alarm condition is the first alarm level typically that you want to alert the driver. You can have two more levels above that. You can have a high level li limit and then a maximum alarm. So you can actually create that alarm and have the overfill alarm uh, generate another buzz or another light indicator for that. And then there's other conditions, obviously, you could, you could set it up for. Okay, great, thanks, Lee. Um, did have another question here. Uh, what types of mechanical failures are most common related to overfill alarms? Uh, electronic overfill alarms or the me uh, mechanical? I wasn't, wasn't clear on that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I said what type of mechanical failures are most common related to overfill alarms? So on, on, the, on the flapper valves, what we've seen is we've seen uh, the, the float itself 
um, disengage and then the flapper valve won't, won't actuate. The flapper valve itself, um, the, the mechanism, the spring on it, disengages and then that, that potentially will not open. And ultimately, that's why they're asking for you to test it periodically to make sure that that doesn't happen. Okay, great. Um, let's see, I think we have time maybe for one more uh, question before we close it out. And um, but just to mention to people that are uh, on the phone, we are recording today's session and so um, we will have that uh, available to share with people in, uh, in the next few days. But um, <clears throat> did, uh, let's see, here's a question, does, does a flapper valve also create some pressurization in the tank? And I think they're alluding to, uh, you know, like the ball valve, does, and, and maybe it's a question around how are those different? Yes, yeah, so, well, because the the ball valve is directly uh, um, plumbed into the to the, the vent line itself, then um, that's why it causes a, a pressure differential in the tank as the the, the tank fills. Um, the flapper valve, if they have the proper uh, 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 stage one vapor recovery hooked up back to the tanker, then the pressure should stay equal in the tank as they're delivering product. So. Technically, the, the flapper valve system doesn't put pressure on the tank. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, so Sean, uh, John, hey, I don't remember if you, if you mentioned that at the beginning, but again, you know, folks who uh, are on this uh, webinar, you know, please fill out the, the survey, but, you know, and also filling out the survey gives you the opportunity to, to uh, participate in a an overfill alarm promo that we're going to we're going to conduct for the folks who've been on this call. Perfect. You you just did my closing for me, Lee. Thank you. Right. That huh. was the next thing I was going to do. But um, again, we're right at the end of our time here, so we want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Uh, want to thank everyone for joining today, uh, Lee. Thank you for another uh, good presentation, and uh, please be on the lookout for more of these EPA-related webinars from us. And um, again, we're recording today's session, and be sure to um, uh, fill out the survey as you uh, exit the presentation. And we thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, John.